Um, okay, so as I was saying, uh, you know, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure to see so many of you, particularly to see so many people who remind me of my own youth, so to speak, when I was a student to get my PhD in statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. And in that context, for that particular PhD in statistics, we had to take a decision, a course in decision theory, which especially at the time, we're talking about the uh, 60s, uh, was really blooming at the time, was becoming quite considered quite important as a foundation of uh, uh, statistics in the more traditional sense, as well as the economics and decision theory. Well, in decision theory, of course, you start with the assumption that there is a goal, something you want to achieve, and there are constraints. Okay, there are some difficulties you have to overcome in order to reach your goal. Some people, Herbert Simon being one, a Nobel Prize in economics, but a political scientist by training, uh, Simon, Herbert Simon, actually say that there is no difference substantially between constraints and objectives and goals. Your goal is to satisfy the constraints and to the extent you satisfy, you reach your goal. Whatever your uh, you know, uh, feeling about that, uh, the wisdom of that observation, it's clear that you, the concept of goal, either in the narrow sense or in the broader sense, which en encloses also the constraints, is extremely important. So the first point I made both in, my pa in the paper that I wrote for this conference, but generally in my own thinking, is the fact that the European integration as it has been developing uh, from the European community to the present European Union, does not dare to have a precise goal. And, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm very fond of history, I think of it, about 19th century history, I say, what about if, say, people like Bismarck in Germany, Cavour in Italy, and other leaders for national independence were saying that their goal is ever closer union, is not really exactly the unification of the country, but you know, ever closer union of the different states that made up their country at the time. So this indefinite expression, this lack of a precise final goal, of course, there are many partial goals, and those are important operationally, but also the idea of what you want to reach at the end of the efforts. And it's extremely important because the choice of means, of course, depends also which kind of, of uh, goals you want to reach and how you want to reach them. Also, the procedure are important. And this, uh, the, that's the first point in my talk, Manuel, let me say, is precisely the, what I see as a key problem of the present approach to European integration, the fact that there is no clear idea where we want to achieve. Now, at the beginning of the process, you know, talking about the late 50s, early 60s, that was perfectly understandable. We don't know what, exactly what we want to achieve. We have to find out what are the constraints, political, economic, etc., and then we'll see, we can decide what we want. But this is, you know, in the early stages of the integration process. 60 or almost 70 years later, that is much more problematic, I found, the lack of a clear objective. And I say that, and if you don't have a clear objective, also you don't know what are the real constraints you have to face. So I say, I always stand by, because of my academic background, I tend to look at the problems of European integration from a point of view that you might say of decision theory. And as I say, this I gave you the basic elements. There is a goal and there are constraints. For some people, constraints and goals is about, this, about the same thing. And that's your, uh, your. Now, and therefore, the fact that, uh, you know, the beginning of the integration process, the European integration process in the early, in the 50s, it was quite understandable that there would be no clear goal. One, people had to see statesmen, they had to understand what was really politically and economically feasible 
as far as integration was concerned in Europe. I mean, that was perfectly understandable. Indeed, it was a wise approach. But some almost 70 years later, that is very problematic. So if there is one first point I want to make, and one I hope it remains with you, at least as a subject of, uh, of uh, reflection occasionally, is precisely how rational can be any effort. I'm not talking about integration, but more generally, if you don't know what you want to achieve. And unfortunately, we don't know. Now, the reason we don't, I mean, we Europeans, starting with the heads of states, is not that a question, a problem of ignorance. It's much more serious. If it was a problem of ignorance, say, well, you know, let's wait a little more time, and we'll become wise, and we'll understand what the problems are. But that's not the problem. The problem is that there is no agreement. There is no agreement. Which kind of Europe do we want at the end? And this, you know, nobody dares at least, I mean, several, pro Objectives have been proposed from the very beginning. For example, in the 50s, there was a very, I think, influential school of law in Germany, Hipsen being perhaps the most, uh, uh, the best known of the uh, member of the school, which, you know, thought of Europe as a, well, actually, I'm not quite. The many people, not Ibsen, Ibsen was critical, <laughs> as uh, my co German colleagues here understand. But you know, the idea was that we replicate at the European level the federal model of Germany. Now, a perfectly sensible thing, except of course it was unrealizable, political, economical, etc. Now, Ibsen, I say, which I mentioned before, was much more careful, and he understood that it was a particular type of of uh, integration was being proposed. And so it, you know, it took its distances about uh, some of the prevailing view in his own country at the time, at least among academics, namely the, the political union. You start with, with economic union, economic integration, and that sooner or later will lead you to political integration. An absurdity, as you can see today, there is absolutely no logic why political integration, excuse me, economic integration should eventually lead you to economic integration, uh, to political integration. You know, uh, I lived many years in the, in the United States and Canada. I mean, there are no two other countries, at least in the Western Hemisphere, which are economically so integrated. But I never heard any serious discussion about Canada and the U.S. joining to form another federation. So this idea, which was at the you know the basic, the foundation of what is called the new fundamental, the, excuse me, the new institutionalist approach to integration, was precisely that if you start with economic integration and you push ahead and you move ahead with economic, eventually you also will get a political integration. So and that's, I think, the first point at this time, in our days, we can say has been obviously uh, rejected. I mean, it's, a, it's, a false, it's simply a false assumption. We can get economic integration as tight as you can, as you wish, as it's convenient, but that does not lead uh, necessarily to political integration. See again Canada and the US, but many other countries, New Zealand, Australia, and so on, that are economically very closely integrated, but they're not. So, okay, so that's the first point. And, but the, the reason why this problem arises when you talk or, or you think or you do something about European integration is again the fact that there is no basic goal. And there is no basic goal final. There are many specific, particular goals, but no f final goal, simply because there is no, no agreement. What do we want to achieve? Well, it varies. You know, varies from country to country, from political elite to political elite. Okay, okay so that's the first point I want to make. Uh, what I consider, the, at least in my view, the key problem of the present approach to European integration is that there is no final goal and no agreement how to get to get. And so, immediate consequence of that uh, uh, concent or, or that recognition, that acknowledgement that there is no common 
goal that everybody shares, to some extent at least, everybody supports, is the fact that the emphasis shifts from the goal if there's no agreement. Again, something you learn in decision theory. If there is no agreement on what you want to achieve, either you experiment for a number of years, and that's in a sense what they're trying to do, or you shift the emphasis on process. And that's why process is so important in EU-style integration. In EU-style integration, process becomes the objective. You know, ever closer union, after all, is a process. And that's what you try to support, to sustain, so to say, to develop. But it's all process, it's not the goal. And again, you know, just think about the, uh, I'm sure in uh, Estonia is the same, but I'm thinking the examples come to my mind, you know, 19th century unification in Germany or Italy, etc. Belgium. I mean, there was the idea what we want to achieve was fairly clear, and that way also large scale support, popular support could be achieved, but not, you know, with this kind of abstraction. Okay, so that's my first point, I don't want to invest, but then the second point, which follows from this then, since you do need a goal of types, it's a goal itself, which is a, it becomes a process. The process of integration, you know, ever close a union, the process becomes a goal. So the, the goal, which again, Go back, going back to my own <laughs> background in decision theory, is an absurdity. You know, the process is something distinguished, separate, distinct from the goal. But then the process, and that's how really European integration has been developing for 70 years. Perfectly understandable at the beginning of the process. You don't yet know what you can achieve, what are the constraints, economic, political. So, you know, you start with some attempts in some direction and see what works. But of course, after almost seven decades, that's hardly defensible anymore. So that's the first point I want to make. So, and then, as I just completed, that's the second point, the goal really become the process. You know, everything, as long as the process is moving on, you say, well, we're integrating Europe. To get where, to do achieve what, well, we'll see. I come back to this point over the end. So but one obvious negative consequence of the approach is that transaction costs tend to increase. And the idea of transaction cost in politics as well as in economics is extremely important. You know, once economists only thought in terms of cost of production, so maybe cost of distribution, and that was the end. But now there's a clear realization that the whole process of production, distribution, uh, trying new models, etc., they're all costs which are related to the same basic phenomenon. And these are called transaction costs, the cost of doing transaction between economic or political actors. So the transaction cost. So that's why, and that's one of the, maybe my second practical point I make, when you read about the small budget of the EU, you should be aware that it's only a fraction of the cost of integration, a small fraction. <clears throat> the amount of money which is transferred to Brussels, it's a, a peanuts, <laughs> as Americans would say, compared to the cost that they impose on each national economy by the fact of integration. You say, but there are also benefits. Of course, of course, I'm all, by, I'm all for integ European integration, but the problem is to choose the right type, the right model of integration. In any case, there are obviously integration costs, and these are transaction costs. Just, just think, which do not appear in the budget of the EU. The cost of bargaining. How long does it take for the member states, for the representatives of the member states to get together, present their case, defend their case, etc.? Those are, we know sometimes the process goes on and on and on without achieving a conclusion, and that's maybe it will be postponed to next year, two years from now, whatever. So this idea of the integration or the transaction cost of integration, I think is extremely important because if the only number so to speak, that is produced in the discussion is the EU budget, that's completely misleading. There are many other costs, and there are also benefits, of course. 
to, uh, they vary from country to country, from industry to industry. They also benefit. But to make a rational calculation, you have to know the benefits, but also you have to know the cost. And my point is that the cost of European integration, EU style, so far, have been either completely ignored or greatly uh, reduced. Okay, so that was a point. Now, the, <clears throat> so, you know, to conclude the second point, when you think about the cost of integration, you have to think in terms of transaction costs, not just the budget of the EU Commission or how much the European Parliament costs, but the whole cost imposed on the economic and political systems of the member states. Okay, enough to say what are my reservations of, uh, of the present approach. It's costly, and it's not obvious, although it may be true in some cases, not true in others, that the benefits are greater than the cost. But in order to arrive to the conclusion, we have to know what the costs are and what the benefits are. The benefits are more obvious than the, than the cost understood in this broad general sense that includes so everything, bargaining cost and cost of uh, choosing second best rather would be what would be first best for your country and so on and so forth. So this is a, uh, this general idea of transaction cost. At this point, they become political transaction costs. You know, the first idea of transaction cost was limited to economic transactions. It goes back to 1937 uh, a famous article produced then, but by now it becomes also part of the political language, a political transaction cost. There is a whole literature on political transaction costs, and that's what we have to pay attention to when you think of the benefits and the cost of European integration. So the idea would be, to, as much as possible, to reduce the this political transaction cost, and that will be the second part of my presentation. In fact, I'll move quickly to the second part. So, but in any case, given this growing realization that integration, European integration is not necessarily and always and for every country beneficial, because by now, I think the amount of skepticism is growing in every country, including, for example, it, my own country, Italy, which at the beginning used to be you know, extremely pro-integration. And now, I think the latest data show that actually the critical, severe critics of the present EU overwhelming number the ones who are in favor. So there is a question of cost, the transaction cost, paying attention, what is real, and of course, paying attention also to the benefits. Okay, so, but the basic of this first part of my presentation, the key idea is this fact that we do not have a clear goal, and in order to have a clear goal, what we want to achieve at the end, not in particular areas, of course, we know more or less, we want free trade, we want this, we want that, but you know, overall, what do you want to achieve? There is no clear idea that is shared by everybody, or at least by a large majority. And that's really, the, uh, with all the consequences I just indicated, the emphasis on process rather than actual results and so on and so forth. Okay, now, let me go to the second part quickly. How, what can we do to improve the situation if that's our goal, if we want to do? So, in some countries, that means really what can you do or what you should do to rescue the very idea of European integration. Because what is most frightening, at least to me, is that people who are critical of the present EU, as I'm also, I'm also critical, but they don't want any, they want to go back to the nation state, you know, to nationalism, etc. And that's certainly something I just completely reject for a number of reasons which I won't spend time uh, clarifying. So that's not the idea. The idea is that we adopted, we experimented one particular approach to integration, European integration, characterized by a lack of a clear objective that you want to achieve at the end, but with also some positive aspects. So there is that. But perhaps we had to shift to a different key, so to speak. We had to take a somewhat different approach. And the approach I suggest in the paper, but also in many of my publications at least, 
is to, instead of emphasizing process, etc., to shift from a purely territorial view of integration, that is, members, countries, member states that get together and exp expand, divide their sovereignty somehow, to a more functional approach, which, by the way, is nothing new. It had been advocated already in the 1940s by Mitrani uh, and by other scholars later on. So the idea is that you integrate areas, functions, economic, but also eventually could be political, where there is an actual demand and desire and political support for integration. So, you know, you start integrating markets and so on and so forth. Maybe at the end. Some of this idea, of course, was also the, you know, in the background thinking, so to speak, of the early advocates of European integration, except they got involved in the process as such and forgot about what is the really that they want to achieve at the beginning. So the idea is that in order to rescue, at least that's my thesis, to rescue the very idea of European integration, because I already said the danger is that people are EU critical, critical of the European Union as it develops now, <coughs> go back to the national level. And that's, to my mind, is an absurdity for a number of reasons I will not discuss, but you can understand at least some of them <laughs> very easily. Rather, the emphasis should go, should move more to the functional integration. And then in functional integration, that is, you integrate functions, way of doing, of organizing some particular economic sphere, some particular economic activity. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, of course, the lie, you know, the fact of membership becomes no, being a member of the union, not as important as the fact that functions, even though this function may be exerted in different ways in different countries, but they get together, try a way of cooperating usefully. So the functional integration, and I was saying this is not a new, it has been going there from the beginning, and precisely Mitrani was uh, the early advocate of functional integration, pointed out the dangers of political integration in the European context. And to him, he was writing in the 1940s, the danger was that a politically integrated union would be necessarily dominated by the strongest member, which member state, which of course was Germany, still is Germany. I don't know that I don't completely share <laughs> the fears of Mitran in this respect, but there is a point, I mean, you know, that uh, even if the country itself, as today's Germany, has no intention of necessarily dominating, but the strongest country become, if we're talking about political union. If it's a, it's a functional integration done along specific tasks, then, you know, in one particular area, it could be Germany, one France or Italy, but even smaller countries could take the lead in particular areas of the thing. So this is a different view, the functional, the strictly functional approach. And if you go back, those of you may be reading something about the beginning of the European integration, the present process, you will find that there was this discussion about the EU, but then the member states, as usual, the national governments, you know, took over the control or the debate, and they emphasize the fact, yeah, but it's member states, you know, it's countries that join together at the political re uh, level, rather than think about the integrating functions, whether or not, whether or not Norway, say, is part of the European Union, or Switzerland, for the matter, there are important areas in which, in fact, they do find necessary then to have special treaties to come to an agreement with members of the European Union. So that's a functional idea, and I think it's an important idea, and it's one that is, uh, in my mind, correspond more closely to the variety of national traditions, uh, national histories, a variety which is also in itself a wealth, but then you have to respect the importance of the thing. Okay, now, to come to, and to conclude my thing, what is the, is there a way, assuming that we are in a 
critical situation, and I think even though by now, at the moment, the, the economies of the Union are going, doing fairly well, so everybody's optimistic, but the long run uh, view does not promise anything really quite, uh, very attractive for the future view. So what will be an alternative way? As I say, the alternative view, the alternative uh, option that may be, it should be considered more than it is at present, is this kind of functional approach to European integration. And limiting maybe, you know, instead of the old uh, dogma of the neo-functionalist, if, if we integrate enough at the economic level, so integrate economically, eventually political union is bound to come. Simply not true, obviously not true. Again, think of Canada and the US, you know, they're economically highly integrated, but surely no idea of a political union between two. So if that is the, the present situation, if that's a problem we're saying, then the, the first thing is we don't want to become, to go back to, the, to nationalism, to anything like that. We have to rescue the idea of European integration by distinguishing the present approach as one possible approach, an experiment in European integration, if you want, but it, it has shown its limits, so maybe it's try, time to try something else. And something else is based essentially on a functional approach in the political domain, and then trying to convince, and that would be the really difficult part, but that to me it's essential if we want to maintain a role for Europe in world affairs today, try to convince people that we have to, yes, we have to unite politically, but in narrow and clearly defined fields. Basically, as you can imagine, foreign policy and security policy. On that Europe, if you want to come, at least that's my, my, point, my viewpoint, if you still want to count something on the world scale in world affairs, it has to present a more or less united front on you know, political, uh, diplomatic matters, so on foreign policy and security policy. So a uh, European army, if you want, but a real European, not just some contingents who are you know, happy to go from one country to another because they get an extra salary, but a real European defense. And a European foreign policy. Now, if you had those two, then what do we have? Assuming for the time we, that we overcame, uh, we overcome all the difficulties, and we have those, we have a simply a confederation. Now, and I'll finish on this point, because the idea of the confederation has been raised by a number of recent, or fairly recent, uh, scholars, both in political science, but also in law. And uh, it seems very attractive, but there is a catch there. <laughs> it is attractive if you, take, if you think seriously about a confederal solution. A confederation, and this is shown by history, and Tocqueville, uh, more than a century ago, was perfectly on that. A confederation can last a long time, like, like the Swiss con confederation, for example, if it's limited to f a few essential tasks. If you ask a confederation to repeat, so to speak, all the function of the nation state, then the confederation is bound. Either it becomes a federation, like in Switzerland, or it will collapse, like the, the American confederation of 1781 collapsed then at the end of the decade uh, in front of the federal government. So confederation, in my view, that's a thesis I did, support that I discuss in my paper is that we need, Europe needs a political objective, absolutely so, but the objective is not to replicate or then on the international level the nation, the nation state, as the early advocates of European integration did, but to, to realize that what is possible at best, at best, is a classical confederal solution. We have a common defense policy, a common foreign policy, and then the rest 
you know, countries are free to associate with other countries with similar problems in a variety of economic domains, but that is, does not have, there is no need of harmonization, you know, that for the, all of Europe to harmonize. The idea of harmonization, which was so central in the 70s and 80s, has already, you know, is not taken seriously anymore. So we have variety. Variety is one of the dimensions of the richness of the European experience. We have to preserve that. But on a few key points, either we are serious, and that means basically foreign policy and security policy, defense policy, or else, you know, let's forget, and then let each country, uh, you know, a group of countries, the Visegrad group, Visegrad group or some, get together and do the best they can do. Thank you very much.